Hello everybody, this is George Frangoulis and I'm with our guest today, George Sisko. George is the uh, proprietor of the Old Professor's Bookshop located at 99 Main Street in downtown Belfast. And we're sitting in the second floor salon over the bookshop. George is a very generous man and he's allowed us to use this space as our studio for Good Morning Belfast. Welcome, George. Thank you so very much for having us Thank here you. today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, it's nice for you to be here. Um, I know your shop will be opening shortly, and we don't have an awful lot of time together, but I do hope we can talk about, more about the shop, mm -hmm. why it's called the Old Professor's Bookshop. Is there some reason it's called the Old Professor's Bookshop? Uh, yes. The reason is that I wanted to call it Consilience. And my family convinced me that was a really dumb idea. And since I'm an old professor, I suggested the old professor's bookshop, and they thought that was much, much better. So that's why it's the old professor's bookshop. Well, it, it seems to work very well. Um, how long have you had the bookshop? This is the 10th year. It is. 10 years, yeah. We opened in eight, uh, 2009. In, no, in June of 2008. So it's, it's June, that it would be the 10th year anniversary. The 10th anniversary? Yeah. Will you have a celebration? Sure. All right. <laughs> It'll be right here. Right upstairs here? Yes. Well, big uh, cake and... A, a party. A party. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll look, for, I'll look forward to that. Mm -hmm. June, what is that again? We haven't decided that. It's going to have to depend on whatever else is going All on. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. I, I think that'll be, a good, it'll be great. Now, what else happens up here besides the filming of Good Morning Belfast. Well, we have our shop talks. That's a once a month uh, public lecture on varied topics from general relativity to poetry, to music, to uh, religion, to, um, gosh, you just name it, politics, philosophy. We've had, um, it must be at least 30 different of these uh, shop talks every month. And next month, April, that's uh, that's National Poetry Month. We'll have yes. a, we'll have an, we'll have Elizabeth Garber. Oh, great! Talking about her memoirs. Yes, she's she's publishing a new book, isn't she? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is the title of that? You're, you're no, gonna, I don't. <laughs> I don't I think know. It's the uh, Architect's Daughter. Yeah, uh, that sounds right. Yeah, I yeah. think that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she's a wonderful poet too. Mm -hmm. We know Elizabeth very well. Uh, what what day will that be? The twenty first. That's the, the third. These shop talks are always on the third Saturday in the month. Okay, so that's the 21st of April. At 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. Yeah. Is there a fee to come and or no, is it free of charge? No, they're free. They're free. They're yeah, free. Right. All right. Just have to make it up the stairs. That's right. Yeah, there's 17 steps. That's the problem. 17 steps. That sounds like an uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie, yes, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. A mystery. Is it a mystery? It's, no, it appears <laughs> no mystery. No, I know. I know. What kinds of books do you have in your shop, George? I call this the Harvard Square Bookshop in Belfast, Maine. And what that means is that I intend it to be something like a college town bookshop mm -hmm. so that professors and students would feel an interest in coming in here because they'll see books that, that are relevant to their particular uh, studies sure. and fields. So it tends to be kind of scholarly. That's what I try to make it. And I can do that because this store has three, it used to have four, bookstores. So we each have our niche. And my niche is this sort of scholarly niche. Scholarly niche. Yeah. 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 So we have a lot on science. We have a lot on humanities, um, a lot on philosophy. I have a specialty in Darwin and evolution. And uh, my background is physics. So I have a lot on uh, physics. Is that sciences. right? Yeah. You were a professor of physics? Where was that? MIT. At MIT. And where else had you taught? UCLA and Boston University. Now, we left UCLA. That's where I spent most of my time. Mm -hmm. Because my wife hates Los Angeles, absolutely hates it. And so when it came about the possibility of getting taking a golden handshake, I'd been there. I'd been chair of the department for seven years. We took it and moved to Boston to... Uh, to a Boston University. Is that like a golden parachute? It's a... You, but not quite you, as you voluminous? Can, you can retire early and get credit for more, I five see. more years. I see. 
Well, how about you? Did you like the West Coast? Oh, listen, that's a sweet job. I'll bet it is. Yeah. yeah. I, we had a little oasis there. Now, Los Angeles is not pleasant because it's got so much traffic. Of course. Uh, of course. And that's what she disliked very much. Also, she doesn't like heat. Los Angeles is hot. And so she was anxious to go. And, you know, a happy wife, happy life, that's a fact. And I took advantage. <laughs> Well, we, we're from here, but spent a little time in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, teaching at the University of Alabama. And down south, they say, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Yes, yes. So you yes. got to keep, uh, mm -hmm. you got to keep her happy. You know, uh, I, I do some teaching at Thomas College. Mm -hmm. and um, In English. In English. We, we don't have the traffic, but we do have the weather. And we've already mm -hmm. missed three, three days yes. of classes because of the bad weather just, uh, just last week. Yes. We missed, I missed a class. Um, so you've taught physics, you've taught, what were the other subjects? Atmospheric science, and uh, at BU I was in the astronomy department. My particular field is called space physics. And this is a guaranteed conversation stopper. So we're not going to talk about space physics. Well, I can't think of a thing to ask about. <laughs> That's that. what I mean. That's precisely what I mean. Except to ask yeah. you about Stephen Hawkins. We have a window now with Stephen Hawking's books and uh, books are, that are relevant related to uh, his work. Curiously, a coincidence, Stephen Hawking died on Albert Einstein's birthday. Is that right? They were both 76 years old when they mm -hmm. died. Stephen Hawking held the Lucasian chair in, at Cambridge University, uh, which was also the chair that Newton held at Cambridge University when he... That was back in the, um, that would have been in 1680s. Um, and the, the coincidence goes on. So Stephen Hawking's had Newton's chair. Einstein replaced Newton's theories. He replaced Newton's theories of, of uh, motion and Newton's theories of gravity. I see. Special and general relativity. So there's a lot of coincidence that happened between Stephen Hawking's and Einstein and Newton. That was Sir Isaac. That was Sir Isaac. You didn't know him, did you? No, no. no. I'm not that old. The old oh, professor, oh, yes. But. <laughs> I'm teasing you, George. I, I know you weren't. Or, or at Cambridge when uh, Sir Isaac Newton was there. Right. Okay. What else can we? Can you tell us about the bookshop? Well, I was, I'm, as I was mentioning, it's got this scholarly uh, sort of aspect to it. Now, the bookshop is small. It's got two aisles. And when you come in the door, if you go to the right and down the right aisle, you're on the science side of the store. Mm -hmm. And I call that, and, and well, if you go down the left aisle, you're on the humanities side of the store. So I call the, the right aisle, the science side, the what is side. And I call the humanities side, the what matters side. And my scientist friends don't like that because they say, well, science matters too. Yes, and I say, but only if the folks on the What Matters side says so. There's only two people that were actually in both sides, and one of them is Darwin. Oh, that's right, yeah, sure. Darwin is, a, is both What Matters and What Is. Yes, I can understand that. And I'm trying to think of who the other one was, but uh, a more contemporary one, Sagan. Okay, Sagan Carl Sagan. On both sides, that's right. Billions and billions. Yes, billions and billions, right. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question about astronomy. Okay. You taught astronomy. Um, did you look through a telescope to teach it? How did you... No, no, no. I could say my, my field is space physics. So it would just be background astronomy. Astronomy for poets, that kind of thing. Same as, it was same astronomy as Astronomy for poets. Right. The same is true at, univer at UCLA, where I taught... But I taught atmospheric science... For poets, but the name, the title of the course was uh, Meteorology in History and Art. That was fun because I got to show a lot of art paintings: uh, Turner, Constable, uh -huh. and uh -huh. George Innes, and um, Jakob van Ruysdael. That was a, because all the, these painters painted skies. How does a painter paint a sky when the clouds don't sit still long enough? to have their portraits taken. So they, they had clever ways of going about doing that. And how did they do that? Well, for example, Roysdell used uh, trees as an example of a cloud. 
You know, trees have these branches right. and they're kind of puffy. Right. Well, if you paint a tree white and put shadows in appropriately, you get something that looks very much like a cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy still had a really clever way of painting trees and it, he, used, he used devices. He used almost metaphors. The metaphor for a cloud was a cannon shot. And you see, he lived in, in Amsterdam, so he saw ships coming into the harbor and, and they would give salutes when they come in and he'd just puff of smoke would come out, come out the cannon. So he put his clouds as if they were coming out of the top of a tree as a cannon shot. He's, one of his most famous paintings has, has, a, has a ship uh, these are sailing ships, of course, with the mast coming up right in the middle, and on the top of this mast is this big cumulus cloud coming right out of the top of it. And it's, you know, it was the canon metaphor. Mm -hmm. You don't know it, unless you happen to think of that. It, does, it looked po perfectly well, next, natural. Next time I'll, yeah. I'll think of that when I look at that painting. Yeah. So he has, many of his paintings have that particular metaphor. And Turner's, and, Turner's skies are really... Well, Turner, you know, that is, that is something. But, um, yes. Our last, uh, our last shop talk last month yes. was on Turner Skies, yes. yes. And uh, yeah, that, uh, he was a genius in the sense that he was like, like 100 years ahead of his time in painting, um, in the sense that he introduced, he introduced, um, I'm trying to think of the word, abstract impressionism, abstract impressionism. His, he was the first person to basically let light make the picture. He didn't have buildings with sharp edges. Everything was diffuse. And it was light that, that composed the entire canvas. That was a hundred years ahead of his time. People at the time thought he was crazy because it didn't look like what you expect a landscape painting to mm -hmm. look like, which mm -hmm. is sharp buildings and straight streets and and horizontals and verticals and diagonals leading into the center of the pictures. No, his was diffuse. And so he had, uh, he had a genius for, for inventing something new. And that was what this talk was about, the fact that, that Turner leaped like 100 years ahead in terms of what he was able to do. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. We, uh, we're going to take a little break right now. And when we come back, we'll continue with George Sis Sisko. Professor George Sisko. Hey everybody, we're back. I'm with George Sisko, our guest, Professor George Sisko. We're uh, above his old professor's bookshop and we're, we're talking books, we're talking artists, we're talking astronomers, we're talking scientists. And I want to ask you about the consciousness group. Now we're going to talk about consciousness. That's another specialty we have. We have a very large section on consciousness because that's kind of one of my passions. We've organized a, what we call the Mid-Coast Exploration of Consciousness, and that also meets once a month. It meets at the library, usually in the third floor, but sometimes in the ground floor, big room, um, to discuss consciousness in all of its various aspects. The part that interests me the most is, what is it? That's what the philosophers would call ontology. What is consciousness? But there's also the aspect of what can have it. Can animals have it? Are octopuses conscious? Are insects conscious? Can robots be conscious? Can artificial intelligence be conscious? If you watch the movies, you'll certainly think so. And then there's the subject of what's called neuroesthetics. What is it that gives rise to our feelings? The only reason we like to be alive is because of how it feels. What is it that gives us these feelings? Where does the will to live come from? That's a feeling. And then there's the subject of um, alternate, alternative forms of consciousness. What happens when you go to sleep? We are conscious, but uh, we're not awake. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, so we think, we think we're unconscious, but we're not. We're conscious. And there is the drugs, and there's um, brain injury, which can induce all. Alter, alternate states of consciousness. So we cover these four topics, ontology, pan-consciousness, neuroesthetics, and alt-consciousness. Kind of go around the site cyclically, we try to do that. <clears throat> um, and uh, what was I going to say about it? Yes, the, uh, the next consciousness group meeting is on intuition. And that will be 
on the 4th of April at the library. About 80% of what our brain is doing is not, it is not known to us. It's subconscious. And so the, our intuitions come out of all of this unconscious cogitation that our brains are doing and, and brings to us insights, imagination, plus, 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 plus this intuition brings out insights. And that we, of course, that's a gift, but it's an extraordinary gift. Most of our, most of our the things that we like to talk about, we do, are, comes out of intuition. So that's, that's going to be uh -huh. the subject of the next talk. Well, I'd like to delve a little more deeply into your own personal beliefs about consciousness. Now, when I was, uh, I remember when I was in elementary school, one of our teachers uh, would berate uh, we poor students and say, you're only using 10% of your brain anyway. Why don't you dig down a little deeper? What do you think about that? Well, I don't know about that, but if you want to know what my, my feelings about consciousness are, the reason I got into it, interested in making a group is that consciousness is now moving from a state in which basically it was the domain of philosophy into a state in which it's become now more and more the domain of science. Now, there's a famous philosopher called Thomas Kuhn who wrote a book, the most referenced book in all of ac academia, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he talked about how, th how science changes. You know, when Einstein presented his theory, that was a, that was a paradigm change. When, Newton, when quantum mechanics was invented in the 1920s, that was a paradigm change. Now, what that means is that after the paradigm change happens, you can assign a graduate student a problem and there are ways for that graduate student to guarantee to get an answer. It might be very hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, applying general relativity to get a, some kind of answer to the question, how does galactic lensing work? Um, it's hard, but it's doable. It's got a definite paradigm. You give them a problem and there is a way to proceed to do it. And if they can solve their problem using those paradigms and they're qualified for a PhD or something like that. Now, until now, until recently, science uh, consciousness studies has not been there. It was what Thomas Kuhn would call pre-paradigmatic subject. You could not assign a problem to a student and be guaranteed that they have a method to solve it. But now we are moving into a stage where it looks like that's going to be possible. We're moving into the paradigmatic stage and the uh, applicable, applicable term here is it becomes normal science, where you don't just start solving the problems that have been opened up by this new paradigm. Now that new science possibility, that normal science possibility, has come about because of a fellow named um, Giulio Tononi. And Giulio Tononi is an Italian, but he's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin. He holds two chairs, mm -hmm. one in uh, sleep studies, uh, which relates to consciousness, and the other in psychology. The, um, and his theory, the one which is actually paradigmatic, is called integrated information theory. And this is an extraordinary thing what he's done. He has turned the question about how can the brain and the neurons firing produce something that is non-physical. This is all physical stuff. This is, brains are made out of matter. Phys neurons firing, that's kind of like uh, electricity. We know how mm -hmm. electricity goes. And wires moving, uh, currents going in wires and all kinds of branches. That's all subject to equations. How can this purely physical stuff give rise to our feelings, our sensations, our thoughts, all of which, how to poetry, Shakespeare, all of which is non-physical. It has no physical substance. There's no mass. There's no way to move it. It, does not, it doesn't occupy space. Physics has to do with mass and energy and space and time and, and motion. None of this does that. So how can physical things give rise to non-physical uh, phenomena? That, that's the mm -hmm. problem which has been the problem in right. philosophy forever. 
And so he's got a way in which you can turn that around. And he takes it, instead of trying to go from the brain up, he's starting at the phenomenon and asking what is required of the physical stuff to produce that phenomenon. And that gives him an axiomatic approach to the problem. And so now you're talking about mathematics. In fact, he's calling it integrated information theory because he's using the theory of information to quantify it. He's got a quantity, which he calls phi, um, which tells you, he quantifies the amount of information that's present in a thing that you think is conscious, like us, or animals, or robots. There is a way in which you can, in principle, quantify it. It's not easy. I mean, there's, it takes an enormous computation to calculate this, this number phi. But it does have a, a, a paradigm for doing it. So in principle, you can now solve those kinds of problems. Beyond that, well, I'm not going to go very far in this direction, but beyond that, his theory is, gives you not only the amount, but the kind, the quality. What does it feel like to be a bat? Um, well, A bat? A bat, yes. What does it feel like to be a bat? That's a famous question that Thomas Nagel proposed to point out that we don't know and we cannot know because we have not the echolocation equipment uh -huh. to know. Um, so that is another way in which you can phrase the, the uh, problem of consciousness. How, do you, how could physics tell you how, what it's like to be a bat? It can't. But what, what uh, Tononi's theory allows you to do is to represent it geometrically. So he's got an algebraic term for the amount, a quantity, and he's got a geometry for what kind. He's got both the amount and the kind in his theory. This is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's just opening up. And so this is like being at the beginning of quantum mechanics in the 1920s. Who could predict computers in I, the 1920s? I suspect, George, that you, you wish you were back in the classroom with this. Yeah, I would instant. certainly do this if I were I know you starting would. over again. Well, I know you right. would. You know, they, they say you can take the old professor out of the classroom, but you can't take the classroom yeah. out of the old professor. Something like that, right. So this is very, very exciting. Um, the, um, especially to me, it's exciting because it gets into the way of having a mathematical way of representing mm -hmm. feelings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you wanted to, I mean, turn the, think of the applications to making robots with genuine empathy. I mean, service, service robots that actually feel mm -hmm. yeah. empathy for what they are, the, they're, they are supposed to be doing, taking care of people, say. Or children, or well, old Stephen people. Hawking's, wasn't he concerned about? <clears throat> yes. No. There's a huge amount of people that are worried about this. Yeah. That for everything that can be done good, you can also use it to sure. do bad. Um, and it's called this. They're worried about the singularity. It's called the singularity. Um, and the singularity happens when robots get so smart that they can build themselves and improve themselves. Now that means things go exponentially away from where you think where they started, and uncontrollably exponentially away from where they started. That's the concern. That this thing could that robots. I mean, this is the kind of the, the stuff of movies, right? That robots could become malevolent, could become mm -hmm. so smart we can't we can't do anything about it. Um, that's the uh, so that's the concern there, George. This has been a fascinating conversation, and we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you one last question. Would you consider coming back and continuing your lecture to our audience? Yes, if I prepare for it, I can do that. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's great. Um, really enjoyed have, having you here today, George, in well, your own space, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, thank and you very much for having me. I look forward to having George Sisko, Professor George Sisko, and we want to thank you again for allowing us to use this space, the salon, above your bookshop. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.